Honda Plaid. Thanks for tuning in to Episode 7 of the Canadian Portfolio Manager Podcast, where we help you become a better ETF investor. I'm your host, Justin Bender, and in today's show, we'll be discussing our new Plaid portfolios. Many of you may not be old enough, or perhaps too old, to recall the epic scene from Spaceballs, where Dark Helmet recklessly pushes his ship past ludicrous speed and into Plaid. In the process, he overshoots Lone Star's Winnebago Eagle 5, leaving a colorful checkered display in his wake. This provides Lone Star's co-pilot Barf with an opportunity to drop his now-famous one-liner. They've gone to Plaid! But why Plaid? I searched the internet but found nothing definitive. Some fans suggest the Plaid joke is a wordplay mashup of warp speed, which is faster than the speed of light, muddled with the lengthwise warp and the crosswise weft used to weave fabrics. And come to think of it, the lengthwise warp on a loom does resemble the thin lines that appear in space whenever a spaceship launches to warp speed. So in this case, combining a lengthwise warp with a crosswise weft gives us plaid. That may be a bit of a stretch. Another fan proposed it came from a 1950s Warner Brothers cartoon, The Hypochondry Cat, where two mice, Hubie and Bertie, are messing with Claude, the hypochondriac cat. They worry him into turning green, then purple, and then, well, I'm sure you can guess what came next. He's turning, um, he's, uh, uh, he's turning plaid! When Scottish bagpipes start to play, Hubie warns Bertie not to overdo it. So, are you more like Bertie, who loves to push the limits? If so, today's tour of our plaid portfolio won't overdo it for you. We'll even hear from a well-known blogger who has successfully been managing a plaid-like portfolio for years. And even for those who are more cautiously Hubie-ish, if it's anything like our ludicrous discussion, it's sure to generate more great questions. Either way, let me know if you ever discover the true origin of the plaid reference in Spaceballs. There may even be a Spaceballs movie lunchbox in it for you. So, there is a mode above ludicrous mode, am I correct? Yes, it's called plaid. How do I get into one of these babies? Similar to the ludicrous portfolios, the plaid portfolios also employ the same ETFs from the ridiculous portfolios, but with a different asset location strategy. And unlike the ludicrous portfolios, the plaid portfolios are truly structured for optimal tax efficiency. They also require you to manage your portfolio's asset allocation from an after-tax perspective, which can be a bit of a pain. The basic idea is to hold all equities in your TFSA and RSP first, and your taxable account last. And within your TFSA and RSP, you're free to let your creativity run wild, with numerous ways to arrange your ETFs to reduce foreign withholding taxes. I've outlined one such process in a mere 10 steps, which I'll share with you now. And as a note, you may need to tweak the process depending on your specific tax situation or preferences. I also recommend having the blog version of the episode handy for this next section as we work through an example of how to plan out your plaid portfolio. So if you're ready to overdo it with me, buckle up. It all begins with step one, which is determining the after-tax value of your RSP. This is easier said than done. A fee-only financial planner should be able to run retirement projections and provide you with a reasonable tax rate assumption. But since you can't know for sure what your tax rates will be on future RSP or RIF withdrawals, the entire process is more theoretical than exact. We'll continue with the example of our top-rate Ontario taxpayer, Pat, from our last ludicrous portfolio podcast. Good news for Pat, she's found another $1 million to play with. Once again, with $100,000 in a TFSA, $500,000 in an RSP, and $400,000 in a taxable account. And let's assume Pat is also expected to pay top rates on her RIF withdrawals in retirement. Therefore, her $500,000 RSP is worth only $232,350 after the government gets its cut. This is calculated by subtracting Pat's 53.53% top tax rate from 100%, and then multiplying her $500,000 before-tax RSP value by that percentage, which is about 46.5%. In 
In step two, we use Pat's after-tax RSP value to calculate her total after-tax portfolio value. Adding together her $100,000 TFSA plus the $232,350 after-tax RSP plus her $400,000 taxable account. That gives Pat a total after-tax portfolio value of $732,350. In step three, we calculate how much to purchase of each ETF, again, from an after-tax perspective. For example, if you're targeting 18% in after-tax Canadian equities, you would multiply 18% times your total after-tax portfolio value of $732,350. That tells you to purchase about $131,823 in a Canadian equity ETF like VCN as your after-tax allocation. And if you're interested, you can refer to the blog post version of this podcast to see all the after-tax asset class weights Pat would have targeted at the end of December 2018. Or you can just move on to step four, where we fill Pat's TFSA with as many Canadian and international equity ETFs as possible. Canadian equities are a natural fit there, since dividends from Canadian stocks are not subject to foreign withholding taxes. And a Canadian-based international equity ETF is also a great option for your TFSA. Since it holds the underlying stocks directly, it has the same foreign withholding tax drag in both a TFSA and an RSP. Just make sure you don't exceed the after-tax target value for either your Canadian or international equity ETFs. There's only $100,000 of cash available in Pat's TFSA, so she won't go over her target by purchasing either asset class. So in our example again, I've assumed Pat purchases Canadian equities in her TFSA first, but international equities would also be acceptable. This brings us to step five, which is to add international equity ETFs to the RSP. Here's the trick to managing your portfolio's after-tax asset mix. Gross up your after-tax target values when dealing with your before-tax RSP. So even though you ultimately need $103,709 of international equities after-tax, you'll actually need to purchase $223,174 before-tax in your RSP. We calculate this by again subtracting Pat's 53.53% tax rate from 100%, and then dividing the after-tax target of $103,709 by that percentage. In step six, we'll add emerging markets equity ETFs to the RSP. The key here is to use a US-based emerging markets equity ETF, like VWO or IEMG, to reduce your product costs and foreign withholding taxes. In other words, optimal asset location requires that you're comfortable with the Norbert's Gambit process for cheaply converting from Canadian to U.S. dollars. Again, we'll need to gross up the before-tax VWO purchase to $70,830 to create $32,915 of after-tax exposure. And using the same formula as above, that means taking $32,915 and dividing it by 100% minus 53.53%. Next up, in step seven, we'll add any remaining Canadian equity ETFs to the RSP. In step four, we bought $100,000 in after-tax Canadian equity ETFs, but we still need to buy an additional $31,823 to complete this asset allocation. As in our prior RSP purchases, we'll need to gross up the before-tax VCN purchase to $68,481. And as Pat is a top-rate taxpayer in Ontario, U.S. equity ETFs are actually more tax-efficient than Canadian equity ETFs in her taxable accounts. That's why we've left the U.S. equities for last. If you have a lower tax rate, you might want to swap steps 7 and 8. Either way, you don't have to perfect this decision in pursuit of an overall asset location benefit. Which brings us to step 8, or possibly step 7 for you when you add U.S. equity ETFs to your RSP. For Pat, we need to purchase $367,900 in before-tax U.S. equity ETFs in her RSP to end up with $170,963 after-tax. 
However, after step 7, she only had $137,515 of cash available to invest in the RSP. So first, she can use all remaining RSP cash to buy a US-based US equity ETF, like VTI. This will eliminate the 15% foreign withholding tax on US dividends. Then, she'll move on to step 9 to complete the allocation. And in step 9, we'll buy US equity ETFs in Pat's taxable account. The VTI shares that Pat purchased in step 8 in her RSP are only worth $63,903 after tax. This means she still needs to purchase $107,060 of after-tax U.S. equities in her taxable account. And since there are no foreign withholding tax advantages of holding U.S.-based U.S. equity ETFs in a taxable account, and since Pat is ludicrously intelligent, I'll assume she purchases $107,060 of VUN. Finally, this brings us to step 10. We'll now buy tax-efficient bond ETFs in Pat's taxable account, probably using an ETF like ZDB. So after just 10 simple steps, we've built Pat's final Plaid portfolio with a before-tax asset allocation of around 70% equity and 30% fixed income. But as with her ludicrous portfolio, looks can deceive. Once Pat cleverly adjusts for future taxes due on the ETFs in her RSP, she is in fact invested in her intended 60% equity, 40% fixed income after tax asset allocation. If we compare Pat's balanced Plaid portfolio to any of our other models 2019 6040 after tax portfolios, it had the highest after tax portfolio value and after tax return. $828,690 and 13.15% respectively. In comparison, the ridiculous portfolio's after-tax portfolio value and after-tax return were $824,152 and 12.54% respectively, while the light portfolio's after-tax portfolio value and after-tax return were $822,456 and 12.3% respectively. Ludacris was the only portfolio that beat Plaid, with an after-tax value of $833,932 and an after-tax return of 13.87%. But remember, this was because it took more after-tax equity risk than all the other portfolios. That is, it wasn't actually an after-tax 60-40 portfolio. Okay, that was exhausting. Who else feels like their brains have gone into their feet? These tax concepts are not easy, so don't beat yourself up if you're struggling with them. One investor who has yet to break a sweat managing his own plaid-like portfolio is Michael James, the popular blogger behind Michael James on Money. Michael is now retired, but he made his living as a tech sector mathematician, so no wonder. Creating useful tax spreadsheets is not only his life's passion, some of his creations are so advanced, I'm a bit concerned they could become self-aware at any moment. Hi Justin, Michael James here. Thanks very much for your informative portfolio series running from light to plaid. My own portfolio most resembles plaid, although I use fewer ETFs. Before I describe my portfolio, it's important to note that I do almost none of the work by hand. I have a spreadsheet that does all the calculations to the point where it tells me exactly what trades to make when I rebalance. I even have a script that emails me when I have to rebalance or invest new cash, so I rarely have to look at my portfolio. Like your Plaid portfolio, I measure my asset allocation in after-tax amounts. After all, you can only buy food with after-tax dollars. My spreadsheet even shows me after-tax account balances. I use US ETFs, so I've had lots of practice with Norbert's Gambit and my asset location includes filling my RRSPs with stocks instead of bonds. My fixed income is mostly in taxable accounts. When rebalancing, I have to remember that I have to trade pre-tax amounts. So say my spreadsheet figures out that I need to sell stock in my RRSP, it has to increase the amount to a pre-tax figure before telling me how much to trade. It's impossible to know what my future tax rates will be, but an estimate is better than just assuming zero taxes when calculating my asset allocation. 
My spreadsheet actually computes expected future taxes in real time, but a rough estimate would have been fine as well. Creating my spreadsheet certainly took some work, but now that it's done, running my Plaid-like portfolio is quite easy, and I'm happy to have a more accurate handle on my portfolio's true risk level. All the best, Justin. Thank you for sharing your insights with us, Michael. In Terminator terminology, your advanced rebalancing spreadsheet sounds like a T-1000 compared to my obsolete T-800 rebalancing spreadsheet. So I think it's time to hit the self-destruct button on it. But first, before we discuss reasons for and against investing in the Plaid portfolios, I've been receiving many reader questions on whether they should hold Canadian-based or U.S.-based international equity ETFs in their RSPs. This sounds like a perfect opportunity for another ETF combat, where we pit two ETFs against one another to test their might. In today's showdown, two international equity ETFs will go head-to-head for your investment dollars, competing across your TFSA, RSP, and taxable accounts. PWL's Director of Marketing, Martin Dallaire, will once again be judging the match. In one corner, we have the Canadian-based iShares Core MSCI EFI IMI Index ETF with ticker symbol XEF. And on the other side of the border, tracking the exact same index, there's the iShares Core MSCI EFI ETF with ticker symbol IEFA. Although either ETF will provide investors with low-cost and diversified international equity market exposure, there can be only one winner in this. Round one, fight! As we learned in episode three of the CPM podcast, when it comes to your TFSA, a Canadian-based international equity ETF like XEF is expected to be more tax efficient than a US-based international equity ETF like IEFA. This is because XEF holds the underlying international stocks directly. So it's only subject to one layer of withholding taxes from when the foreign dividends are paid directly to Canada. In contrast, IEFA is subject to two layers of withholding taxes. The first layer occurs when the foreign dividends are initially paid to the US, and these are not recoverable. The second layer is levied when the net dividends are paid from the US to Canada. Unlike in your RSP, there's no US-Canada tax treaty to eliminate the 15% withholding tax on foreign dividends paid from the US to your TFSA. IEFA is less than a third the cost of XEF, with an expense ratio of 0.07% per year, compared to 0.22% for XEF. However, IEFA's fee advantage is no match for XEF's tax-efficient structure. Over the past five years, ending December 31, 2019, XEF would have returned an average of 8.46% per year after all fees and foreign withholding taxes. IEFA would have returned 8.24%, lagging XEF by 0.22% per year. Also, as IEFA trades in US dollars, Canadian investors would have first needed to convert their loonies to dollars to purchase the fund. And without using the Norbert's Gambit strategy to cheaply buy US dollars, this could have cost investors an additional 2% at the onset, further reducing the returns on IEFA. XEF wins. Round two, fight. Although IEFA took a beating in the first TFSA round, the RSP is a more level tax playing field for the ETF. Here, the second layer of 15% U.S. withholding taxes no longer applies due to U.S.-Canadian tax treaties. This results in a similar foreign withholding tax drag in both. But being a U.S.-based fund, IEFA does have the upper hand when it comes to fees and economies of scale. These benefits have enabled IEFA to outperform XEF by 0.25% per year after fees and foreign withholding taxes over the same five-year period. However, Canadian investors need to be thoughtful when purchasing IEFA in their RSP if they don't have any US dollars. If you simply accept the brokerage's currency conversion cost of around 2%, it will take around 8 years before breaking even. This is calculated as a 2% upfront currency conversion cost divided by the 0.25% annual expected return benefit. Plus, when you eventually sell your IEFA shares, and convert your dollars back to loonies, you'll get hit with another currency conversion cost. 
further eroding the expected return benefits of holding IEFA in your RSP. So if you're considering purchasing IEFA in your RSP, first make sure you're purchasing enough to make it cost effective, such as $10,000 or more. Also, be sure to use the Norbus Gambit strategy to cheaply convert your Canadian dollars to US dollars for each purchase. IEFA wins. But make sure you know how to do the Norton's Gamble. Round 3. Fight! Finally, we'll take this fight to your taxable account. Once again, XEF is expected to have the upper hand when it comes to withholding taxes, as only one layer applies and is usually recoverable. IEFA is subject to two layers of withholding taxes on foreign dividends, and only the second layer from the US to Canada is generally recoverable. With its lower product fees and economies of scale, IEFA is still a worthy contender, but it can't compete with XEF's tax-efficient structure. Over the same five-year period, XEF returned 5.79% after all fees, withholding taxes, and income taxes. IEFA returned 5.65%, lagging its rival by 0.14% per year after tax, using Ontario's top tax rates. Investors in XEF would have also appreciated the convenience of purchasing the fund with their Canadian dollars, and also avoiding any tedious T1135 tax reporting, which could be required if you hold IEFA in a taxable account. Finish it. Overall, XEF is the winning holding for your TFSA and taxable account. IEFA may have a slight advantage in your RSP, but only if you're willing to complicate your life by dealing with US dollars and Norbert's Gambit. If you'd rather stick with Canadian dollar purchases across your entire portfolio, XEF is the best everyday option for all account types. XEF wins practicality. Our grand Spaceballs-inspired adventure is very nearly over. As with all our other portfolios, let's wrap with a review of the advantages and disadvantages of going to Plaid. There are three main advantages. First, it's officially the most tax-efficient portfolio in the bunch, and also the most fashionably dressed. As the Plaid portfolios offer the most portfolio management flexibility, you can hold US-based foreign equity ETFs in your RSP, and Canadian equities in your TFSA, reducing your withholding tax drag. Second, it offers lower expected capital gains from rebalancing. Since you can hold most of your equities in your RSP and TFSA, you can also do most of your portfolio rebalancing there. This can reduce the tax drag from occasional rebalancing. This may be more significant if you're not adding enough new cash to your portfolio to rebalance it organically over time. Third, you can benefit from lower expected year-end capital gains distributions. Once again, since most of your equities are held in TFSAs and RSPs, you won't be hit with big year-end capital gains distributions from your equity ETFs. You could still receive distributions from the tax-efficient bond ETFs in your taxable accounts, but hopefully not to the same extent. Now, to five disadvantages of going plaid, especially if you use clashing colors. First, You're not Marty McFly. Without a time-traveling DeLorean, you'll never know for sure what the future tax rates will be for your registered account withdrawals and taxable capital gains. This means you'll never know for sure if you're actually maximizing your future tax efficiency. Second, you'll need to take more before-tax equity risk. In other words, to go plaid like Pat did, you'll have to allocate 70% to equities before tax, understanding it's really just 60% after tax. Pat can live with that. She has nerves of steel and understands that it's not her, but the government taking the extra equity risk. But not all investors are as rational. If you might blink when markets go risky, you may want to take Hubie's advice and not overdo it. Third, you'll need to love numbers. I personally love numbers, but even I got a splitting headache creating this podcast. And that's using relatively straightforward, static examples your real-life portfolio management will be much more complicated. You'll need to continually update your after-tax ETF values, especially as unrealized capital gains accumulate in your taxable account 
they'll create lower after-tax values for the appreciated funds you continue to hold. Fourth, you'll need to be a pro at Norbert's Gambit. Part of the Plaid portfolio's tax efficiency comes from investing in U.S.-based foreign equity ETFs in your RSP, which requires you to get up close and personal with Norbert's Gambit. Are you really ready for that? Fifth and finally, you'll need to be mindful of higher expected minimum RIF withdrawals. As your RSP will be significantly biased towards equities, it will also be expected to grow faster than your taxable account. This sounds great, until your minimum annual RIF withdrawals bump you into a higher tax bracket. Or worse yet, they might subject you to the dreaded old age security clawback. So do you think you've got what it takes to go plaid? Before we conclude entirely, we'll wrap with an Ask Bender question from a listener named David. He sounds like he may be a candidate for doing so. Hi, Justin. I've been using VTI and VXUS in my RRSP to take advantage of the lower management fees as well as save on foreign withholding tax while keeping my Canadian equity in my TFSA. I try and keep an after-tax allocation of roughly one-third Canadian, American, and international markets. This seemed to be a logical decision when I set up my investments a number of years ago. However, I am now in the fortunate position of having used up all of my contribution room in these accounts and have started investing in a taxable account. This has made trying to figure out asset location quite a bit more complicated due to unknown future capital gains taxes. And I've been wondering if it's even worth worrying about the withholding tax on foreign equity in my TFSA. I know at PWL you simply hold the same portfolio in each account type, but it feels wrong to have the same asset allocation in each account, knowing that Canadian equity has tax benefits in non-registered, and foreign equity has withholding tax in the TFSA. Unfortunately, this seems like a mathematically unsolvable problem without knowing future information, but it also seems to be admitting defeat to hold assets in the suboptimal accounts. Should I just bite the bullet and hold the same asset allocation in each account, or is it worthwhile to keep my asset allocation of my registered accounts optimal for foreign withholding tax while keeping one third of each market in my taxable account? Hi, David. There are many great questions here. As you're already successfully managing your portfolio from an after-tax perspective, you likely only need a few tweaks to optimize your portfolio. But as you mentioned, true optimization is impossible with so many unknowns. But perhaps we can find a reasonable solution that helps you move on from any analysis paralysis. Although I recommend that most do-it-yourself investors simply hold the same asset mix across all accounts, I should point out that those of us at PWL Toronto do typically manage our clients' portfolios a little differently. Our asset location strategy is usually similar to the ludicrous portfolios from episode 6, where the rule of thumb is to hold equities in the TFSA first, taxable accounts second, and RSP last. Then again, some of my other PWL colleagues do simply hold balance funds across all accounts, similar to the light portfolios from episode 4. It's still a great strategy with many benefits. As you mentioned in your question, David, you're currently managing your portfolio's asset mix on an after-tax basis, which is similar to the plaid asset location strategy from our current episode. You also have a 100% equity allocation, which does reduce the potential benefits from any asset location strategy. Asset location strategies are generally more useful for investors with a mix of stocks and bonds in their portfolio, but there are still some opportunities available for more aggressive portfolios. Let me illustrate after making several assumptions about you, your investments, and your investment accounts. First, we'll assume you're a resident of Alberta for tax purposes. We'll say you're earning $100,000 annually, making your marginal tax rate 36% in 2020, and you'll be in a similar tax bracket in retirement. Let's further assume your marginal tax rates on eligible Canadian dividends, capital gains, and foreign dividends are 15.15%, 18%, and 36%, respectively. Now to your investments. Let's assume all your equity ETFs have similar returns over your investment horizon before product fees and foreign withholding taxes. We'll split your equities as you described earlier. In other words, we'll put $100,000, or a third, in VCN, a Canadian equity ETF, and $100,000 in VTI, a U.S. equity ETF. For the remaining third, we'll put $75,000 in VIU, an international equity ETF, 
and $25,000 in VWO, an Emerging Markets Equity ETF. You'll note that I split your VXUS holding into separate international and emerging markets equity ETFs. This will provide us with more options when locating the asset classes across accounts. Finally, we'll make some assumptions concerning your account values. Here, we'll assume you have $100,000 to invest in your taxable account and $75,000 to invest in your TFSA. As you're managing your portfolio from an after-tax perspective, we'll assume your RSP is worth $125,000 after the government gets their cut. In total, your Plaid portfolio is worth $300,000 after tax. So based on all these assumptions, where should we locate each asset class for maximum tax efficiency? Starting with the taxable account. It's best to hold Canadian equity ETFs in your taxable account first. The lower tax rate on eligible dividends for an Alberta taxpayer earning $100,000 is more than enough to offset the withholding tax drag on foreign dividends received in the TFSA by the remaining foreign equities. So in our example, we'd purchase $100,000 of VCN in the taxable account. Next, the TFSA, Canadian-based international equity ETFs that hold the underlying stocks directly are a great choice for your TFSA. Funds with this structure will only be subject to one layer of withholding taxes on their foreign dividends, which cannot be avoided if we hold the fund in an RSP instead. So in our example, we would purchase $75,000 of VIU in your TFSA. And finally, there's your RSP, a US-based emerging markets equity ETF like VWO would be subject to two layers of withholding tax when held in a TFSA, so it's better to hold it in your RSP instead. There, it would avoid the second layer of withholding taxes. US-based US equity ETFs are exempt from the 15% withholding tax on US dividends, so you've already made an excellent choice to hold VTI in this account. So in your RSP, you would purchase $25,000 of VWO after tax and $100,000 of VTI after tax. Note that these are the Canadian dollar figures and would need to be adjusted to US dollar figures before purchasing. And as you're managing your portfolio from an after-tax perspective, you would need to gross up these figures, just as I did in our example from this episode. Fortunately, it sounds like you're already very comfortable with these concepts. Now, I know my assumptions are probably not 100% accurate for you, but based on them and your portfolio size, the annual cost savings should be around $360. That's about $30 per month or around $1 per day. David, I'll leave you to decide whether you feel the potential cost savings are worth the extra hassle. It may be easier just to save a bit more in your portfolio each month. Then again, like Michael James, it sounds like you've already wrapped your head around the most gnarly after-tax asset allocation concepts. If so, you may not find the extra work overwhelming at all. Whatever you decide, I wish you all the best with your investing success. We've now reached the end of our portfolio journey. Our Plaid portfolio has overshot the complexity of the rest of our models by about a million miles, so no one will blame you if you decide to stop and rewind. As I've said before, you can begin and end your adventures with a light portfolio and still be light years ahead of most do-it-yourself investors. Then again, as your wealth hopefully accumulates and your portfolio navigation skills mature, you may eventually want to accelerate your efforts. There are more great CPM episodes in the works, but I'd love to hear from you regarding any topics you'd like me to cover. And as always, your voicemail messages are greatly appreciated. Just record your question using the Voice Memo app on your iPhone, or any similar app, and email the file to jbender at pwlcapital.com. Thanks for listening.